Welcome back to Outside the System. I'm very excited to share this episode with my good friend and Made You Think podcast co-host, Nat Eliason. Nat is a writer, and we focus most of our episode on his book, Crypto Confidential. It's a fantastic and entertaining book, regardless of if you have crypto experience or not. During this episode, we discuss Nat's experience in crypto, his evolution as a writer, fiction versus nonfiction, and of course, went on some tangents. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to order a copy of Crypto Confidential using the link in the show notes. You can also send us a boost on Fountain or any other app that supports Podcasting 2.0. Leaving a review and sharing on social media are also great ways to support the show. Without further ado, here's my discussion with Nat Eliason. Enjoy. Nat, first time uh, we're ever doing a podcast together. Obviously, you were on my list from the beginning of the the podcast, and just waiting for the right occasion to uh, to get you on. This is it. This is the right occasion. Yeah, and you were you're actually one of the most outside the system people, um, which we're definitely going to dive into in this uh, in this episode. Just your process and just I don't know your whole career. I feel like is the epitome. I don't know. Of, like, I'm like I'm, free- a, I'm a I'm a I'm a simp for trad pub now, so I yeah, feel like Nat- I've. I'm back in the system. No, you're. I feel like the definition for you. I I think you might have tweeted this at some point, but you're like the definition of a free range human. You don't yeah. let <laughs> you, you don't let like boundaries of like what you're supposed to do kind of stop you. Or like you know, you were a marketer at one point in your career, a writer kind of throughout your career. In this book, you obviously talk about you know teaching yourself how to be a crypto developer. Oh, yeah, you just kind of go wherever you want. Or worse, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so first of all, amazing book. Had it right in front of me. Uh, I read it. Uh, is, I, you know, you'll see if I read it, I guess, if my questions make sense or not. <laughs> For, first of all, like what, and we'll talk about what the book is about, but like what motivated you to tell this story? Because for people who haven't read this book, and I think this will go out right before the book is released, but I highly recommend ordering it and getting your hands on it as soon as possible. Like, what motivated you to tell this very raw story? Because some books are all about, especially these like tell all type books, they always try to paint themselves in a really good light. And not saying you painted yourself in a bad light, but you kind of tell the good and the bad. It's like, yeah, this stuff worked out. And then you also talk about this stuff really didn't work out. Um, I remember one example you had that smart contract where, uh, you know, you, I think you went to dinner, came back, and you basically, your entire wallet had been drained. Uh, yeah, yeah. While, yeah. <laughs> while I was at dinner, I, I came back from dinner to discover someone had stolen thirty five grand from me. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, what when you were sitting down and thinking, like, I should write, like, put this in a book. Like, what led to that thought? Like, did somebody say, "Oh, these are great stories. You should put this in a book," or was it like someone could learn from this? Like, what was the the motivation behind that? Yes. Yeah, so there there were a few things that led to it, and you know, as, as I was going through the whole like journey that I lay out in Crypto Confidential, I was starting to write articles about what was going on in the space because kind of like you said, the one common thread in all of my work has been writing. I've always just been writing online and I'm decently good at taking complex things and explaining them so a lay audience can get a better understanding from the outside. So I was writing these articles about crypto And I started writing about these crazier and crazier aspects of the DeFi, decentralized finance industry in particular. And I had a friend, Evan Armstrong from the Every.2 Napkin Math newsletter, who messaged me at one point and he said, he was like, some of the stuff you're talking about with leverage on leverage on leverage and these, you know, crazy, like stacked, yeah, like leverage and barring whatever schemes that people are doing reminds me a lot of what was going on in 2008 with mortgage-backed securities and credit default swaps. And then, you know, people were doing synthetic CDOs where they package a bunch of them together and then like bet on the outcomes of them. And this like crazy, crazy like leverage system that eventually collapsed, right? He was like, you know, some of the things that you're writing about in crypto really remind me of that. And that was the first little inkling I had that there might be an interesting story to tell about that time period, about that like 2020 to 2022 bull market. But then it was a question of, 
you know, do I even want to write something bigger about it? And what would the story even be? And that was like February of 22. So the market was still ripping or it wasn't ripping anymore, but it was still doing really well. And there was still a ton of hype in crypto, a lot of excitement. None of the big crashes had happened yet. And I was still really involved, but I started talking to an agent because I thought there might, it might be interesting to do a book here. And then when the market crashed, I kind of had this question of, do I want to stay in crypto, keep programming, keep like trying to, you know, trade, trying to like build my stack up, or do I want to take my winnings and actually focus full time on writing? finally because that had always been a goal in the back of my mind like at some point if i have enough of a nest egg it'd be cool to just go all in on writing and i kind of realized that that would that was probably my best opportunity to do it because i had gotten really lucky with being in the right place at the right time chasing it in the right direction and coming out of it with a pretty interesting story and then i assumed i had the writing chops to turn that story into a pretty interesting an exciting book. And in the beginning, it was going to be a little bit more, a little less of my story and more of what else was going on and explaining things. And I pretty quickly came to the decision that a Bitcoin 101, what is DeFi type book would be extremely boring and nobody would buy it. (laughs) And it wouldn't do the goal, which was to demystify the industry a little bit. And the, the really the big thing that I wanted to try to do and that I did a lot in my writing was explain that, yes, there is a lot of crazy, stupid shit going on. There's all these, you know, ridiculous NFTs and, you know, like chains with no activity on them that are raising hundreds of millions of dollars and these huge hacks and scams, and all this stuff. And there's a very legitimate side of the industry that is doing really cool things. And you have to learn how to tell those two apart. And you have to be honest about both of them existing. So I, you know, thinking about all of that, it became pretty clear that like the best way to show people that and to explain that and teach it is to not make it feel like they're learning anything at all. To just make it such a fun story that at the end, they've actually downloaded a decent amount of crypto knowledge, but they don't even really realize they did it. I use this analogy a lot with my editor where when you, if you ask somebody to name a few Harry Potter spells, they can probably do it, right? You know, they can be like, oh, Lumos for light. And they can, you know, Wingardium Leviosa and Avada Kedavra, right? Like they they have that knowledge, but they never read it. They never read a textbook on Harry Potter spells, right? They never read like, these are the 10 Harry Potter spells that you need to know now article, right? Like they read a fun story and they downloaded the knowledge along the way. And so that was really the goal was, could I write a really, really fun story leaning on my experience that would sneak into crypto knowledge along? Yeah, that. First of all, the Harry Potter example is amazing. I can just imagine <laughs> someone trying to sell an online course of, you know, how to learn Harry, like how to all the Harry Potter spells and no yeah, one would buy yeah. it and no one would learn anything. And here's somebody, you know, people just read seven very long books and they just absorbed it and they know what the spells do without actually having to think about it. It's just second nature and it, totally. for anyone who's read the series. So that makes a ton of sense. The other thing that you mentioned about being kind of in the right time, right place, and coming out with a story, it reminds me of, uh, I don't know who said it, but I remember reading this somewhere, to ha- to be a good writer, like you should live an interesting life. Yeah. And yeah. I think that is so true because, yeah, I mean, if you were, let, let's say you were on the outside looking in, you could never write a book like this no. uh, that would get people's attention. And And I knew that there were going to be serious journalists writing outside looking in books. Obviously, Michael Lewis had his. Deke Fox had his. There's a a third one by Ben McKenzie, but all of them are journalists. Like All of them are outsiders. None of them were really in it. None of them were really like writing smart. I mean, definitely not writing smart contracts or doing any of the crazy day trading, like in the discord, talking to anonymous people, like all of that shit. They were, you know, taking a journalist stance on it. And I have no aspirations to be a journalist. And I never find those stories as interesting as the insider stories, people who are actually like behind the scenes working in it, because they can give a much richer tapestry of what was going on than somebody who's trying to like, you know, draw an elephant from feeling it in the dark. Yeah, I think there are, there are some of those books that end up doing a good job that are 
from the outside in, but those tend to be carried by the stories that they're covering. Yeah. I read The Smartest Guys in the Room, the Enron book recently, and incredible. Like, honestly, one of the better nonfiction books I've ever read. And that was written by a journalist, by the, the journalist who broke the story originally, the Wall Street Journal reporter. But, you know, it was also just an incredible story on its own. Well, and yeah, I, I will say the other the, the other big caveat here is I had, the, you know, the other thing I had is that I was already a decent writer and I got a lot better in the process. Yep. And so I feel like that's the extra element because I think you're right. There are wonderful outside looking in books by journalists, but if somebody at Enron had the same writing chops as that yeah. person and could write the story, it would probably be even better. Yep. That, like, I could imagine, I could imagine like someone try, I don't know if there is a book about his life or about his uh, experiences, but like Martin Shkreli, I yeah. could see like an outside looking in book, not being as good as his writing ability. And the only reason I think his writing ability is good is he's a great tweeter. Great which tweet. I know, but <laughs> it's a good start uh, at least. It's yeah. a good start. Like honestly, if he writes a book that's as engaging as his Twitter account, like it will probably be better than what a journalist could write. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's that's where I think some of like the Gonzo journalism can be so entertaining, right? Yeah. Like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was an inspiration for this book, just kind of like with the with the manicness, right? It's obviously mm. nowhere close to that level of absurdity, and you know, I've never actually read that. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of a hard book to read because it's so chaotic. Like he does a very good job. And I mean, I think this is also just probably how it, it was of you feeling like you're in a fever dream the whole time. And there are actually parts of Crypto Confidential where I deliberately messed with the writing style to try to make the reader feel stressed out or confused or lost because I wanted to try to like, transmit some of that feeling that like we were having at the time of just being lost and confused and manic and, and all of that yeah honestly that really came through uh, also I, sleep deprivation came came through pretty yeah. uh pretty strongly i think you also mentioned you know i think just all the stress of what you were doing on a day-to-day -day and night-to-night -night basis you were like drinking a lot like it was, I actually wasn't I, drinking during that period i had to quit drinking like, oh okay yeah and i actually i had that in there as a chapter early on as part of a chapter that the the cost on my psyche was getting like so extreme that i had to just like cut out alcohol because i was it i felt like i was going anxiety. crazy Yo, yeah so yeah. much yeah yeah i think maybe it was the sleep deprivation thing that i'm remembering where it was just like it it, it almost just like everybody's felt that feeling of going like many days in a row without sleeping well yeah. And how the world kind of feels like it's in a fog. Man. And like how when, it seemed. That was that was what you were you were getting yeah. across in the book. And, and, yeah. and when a lot of the biggest action in the book is happening, when you know, when people have put like over hundred million dollars into the code I wrote and I'm like really freaking out, we also have a two month old at that point. Yep. yep. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really not sleeping between like the stress of that and you know, just being a new parent. The first four months your sleep is kind of unpredictable. Actually if Th that might be a good segue. Let's go mm -hmm. into the arc of the of the book. Like, obviously, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't I don't think you need to tell the whole story of the book. People can read the book for themselves. But um, just the broad strokes, because I think that'll give a good jumping off point for some of the other things I want to make sure we hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the broad strokes are basically that I was running a marketing agency through 2020. I stepped out at the end of that year. Start of 2021, I was trying to, like, get a new career going. And I was learning programming because I'd always enjoyed programming. I and I didn't feel like I could go fully into writing yet. I didn't think the money would work. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to learn programming, try to get a job that way. Opened my Coinbase one day and realized that, you know, holy shit, Bitcoin is blowing up. And this amount that had just been sitting in here and doing weekly market buys has turned into a lot of money. Let's go see what go what's going on. And then pretty quickly got in my head that, okay, even programming is too slow. I should just go all in on crypto and try to make a ton of money there. Because the other factor was that uh, my wife and I were trying to have our first kid. And we, you know, I know you're familiar with this through work at TrueMed. You know, there's like a lot of people have trouble having kids now. And we had kind of like mentally budgeted for six to 12 months, you know, before she would get pregnant. We had time to, you know, get our work stuff and money stuff situated. And then she gets pregnant the second month. Suddenly <laughs> that timeline has been dramatically condensed. I'm not making any money. She wasn't making very much money either because she had just started a new career 
and we're like kind of living off savings. And I'm just like, okay, I need to make as much money as humanly possible, as quickly as possible. Let's just go all into crypto, feel irrationally confident that I can figure this out. And so start off with like day trading, getting into some of the DeFi stuff, eventually realize that I should try to like work with a team so that I can just get paid tokens and then start doing some work for this team. That project ends up blowing up in kind of a crazy way, which leads to all of these unintended consequences and all of this, you know, extra money on the line that, you know, we, we have a screenshot or they have a screenshot somewhere in their company discord of the crypto treasury for their, for the game at one point being valued at over a billion dollars because just because of their token. Right. And, you know, there's so many caveats to that statement because there's, you know, there's all these problems in crypto with market value versus, you know, actual liquidity behind things. But, you know, it was literally, this was like a freelance project that I took on and they didn't have any money to pay me. So I agreed to be paid in tokens. Then at, at the peak of the craziness, the tokens that they agreed to pay me were worth about $13 million. So <laughs> it was like, yeah, it was just this absurd, you know, you know, I don't know anything. I'm an outsider looking in. How do I get into this space? What's going on to, you know, people might be about to lose $100 million because there's an error in this code that I wrote and like all the money that I made might be about to be wiped out. And all of that happens in like 10 months. So pretty absurd arc to happen over the course and, of a year. And your daughter was born in that yeah, same time. Yeah, <laughs> my daughter was born and... There were, there were all these, you know, additional factors wrapped into it, right? Like my wife, Cosette, her work ends up taking off at the exact same time. So we're just, we're almost like two ships sailing in the night for months because she's running all over Austin doing real estate deals, coding and gambling 12 hours a day. <laughs> we're like both hard on this path to try to make as much money as possible. And then, you know, it just gets completely out of hand. Starting at the end because this question is kind of burning in my mind Mm -hmm. what made you stop like Mm. you know obviously the market crashed but people make money on down markets and up markets what made you was it like okay i've had enough like i've done well enough and now i want to go into writing like you were saying was it any other factor of just like okay now my daughter's here this is actually like way too risky to keep doing Yeah. yeah It's a great question. Was it, it was lack a- of good projects, maybe? Because also, like, I mean, you kind of, a lot of the money you made, obviously you made some on the day trading and the farming, but a lot of it came from finding actually a good project and getting in at the right time. Yeah, it, you know, it came from a few things. It, one was that it, there were just a couple of these very powerful, like, wake up and look around moments where I realized just, how absent I was, how I was just totally locked into this crypto world. And I just didn't like, I didn't like what it had done to me and to my relationship. And it became pretty obvious that it wasn't something I could do lightly. And I mentioned this in the book too, if you can make a lot of money going all in on these manias. And like, yes, this is about the 2020 to 2022 mania, but it's really about any kind of financial mania in general. Because if you go all in and you're very smart about it, you can do extremely well, but you really have to go all in. If you're half in, half out, you're just going to lose money because you're not going to be on top of things. And But there was a period where I was pretty seriously considering joining a crypto VC firm because I had started writing these articles about tokenomic design and crypto and gaming, and it actually built a decent amount of influence in that sector. And so I was starting to talk to like gaming VCs to join them and help their teams. And I kind of realized as I started doing that, that if I didn't quit now, I might not come back out for five or 10 or 15 years. And if I if I, if I failed, you know, if I got to 70 or 80 or 90 or whatever, and I was never a successful crypto VC, I wouldn't care at all. That would mean nothing to me, right? If you like fast forwarded me to my deathbed and said, hey, Nat, you failed to become a successful crypto venture capitalist. I'd be like, I don't give a fuck. But if you told me, Nat, you failed to ever like write anything good because you got too distracted, I would really, really care about that. So that that was probably one of the biggest factors. And the death test. That's yeah, such yeah, a good death one. Test. It's yeah. a great one, right? Yeah. And 
you know, it, the, the other thing that became really obvious really quickly was it, you, if in the like digital nomad financial independence, retire early crowd, there's this sort of, you know, minimalism, uh, frugality, living below your means, whatnot mentality that I'd had for a long time. And it had worked very well for me. But as soon as I kind of came into this bit of wealth and I was not pulling most of that money out and almost all of the money went away. Um, but there were the there was this brief period where I, I literally could just like roll over in bed in the morning and hit a button and I had made another like 20 or 40K that was just like getting sent to my crypto wallet. So it was like every day I was waking up and seeing that number. And we were like going out for lunch with oysters and champagne, you know, getting sushi, just like going shopping at the Gucci store for fun. I literally like impulse bought a Rolex at one point. It just completely corrupted At least those me. hold their value a decent amount. Okay, so, so that's the funny thing. The <laughs> Rolex actually held its value better than any of the crypto. I so I, I was really kicking myself as the market crashed. I was like, why did I buy this stupid fucking watch? Like, what is wrong with me? And then six months later, <laughs> Ethereum is at $800. You know, it's gone down 80%. And I look at the value of the Rolex and it's like the same. Yep. And then I'm, I'm like, well, okay, it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's actually no, kind of smart. Uh, one of my one of my wife's friends, uh, Impulse, bought a Chanel bag when she had got her like this promotion. That was a really, I mean, it was a really good promotion. At like, if the Chanel bag's value were to go to zero, like you'd imagine, all all apparel does, uh, it was not a good buy. But what ended up happening is, I guess for whatever reason, they've upped the prices. I, I don't know anything about yeah. luxury apparel and and bags and fashion but they've upped the prices so the bag that she bought i want to say she paid like 4k for it Mm -hmm. and she hasn't really used it because it's like too nice of a bag to use yeah yeah at all so it's just still kind of sitting in the box the resale value is now like six or something yeah like like, what a good asset but it it, it was just so you know it in some ways it really feels like a blessing that i had that brief period of just a stupid amount of money coming in to see how quickly it got its hooks in me yeah. So that then when it basically all went away, I could, I, I know now that because I figure I'm going to make more money in my life, but I, I know the effect it's going to have on me now if I let it. And that's a very valuable lesson to have. You kind of too. got to play with it. It's almost yeah. like, in a, you know, in a movie, it's like, like where, yeah, it's like, yeah. uh, there was an Adam Sandler movie, I think Mr. Deeds or something, right. Where he got a yeah, lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, he went from this regular guy, you know, kind of lower class guy to like being mega wealthy and like the effect it had on him. Yeah, it's like you got to play with it. Um, so one question I had actually, uh, as you were saying all that, like as you oh, wait, so oh, can I ahead. just add one more thing on that? Yeah, yeah, go which for was it. this is tying back to your first question of like, why did you write this book? And that was part of it, too, was I, I think some people might look at the book and think that, oh, this is a warning not to get involved in manias. But it's not really a warning not to get involved. It's a warning that you just have to be careful if you do. Because you you know, like you sort of can't predict what it's kind of like the the dog chasing cars, you know, what's going to happen if you catch it. And I was so unprepared for the consequences of, you know, going all in that it it ended up having all of these like pretty awful effects on like my personal life and my mental health and all of these things. So that's almost the more important message is like, you can play, just understand that you're playing with fire here. Well, your all in point is a really good one. You like, I think a lot of people try to dabble um, yeah. and dabbling, at least from the, one of my takeaways from the book is like dabbling is worse than not playing at all. Because you're probably exit liquidity for somebody yeah. yep. all the time. Like people will text me and, you know, this will text me or DM me and they'll say, hey, you know, it seems like crypto is coming back. What should I buy? And I pretty much always tell them just buy Bitcoin and ETH and like maybe Solana. Because yep. if you're That's not going to, to if you're not going to quit your job and go full time on this, don't touch all the crazy stuff because you won't be clued in enough to know when to get out. And I think people think that buying the right thing at the right time is the hard part. It's not. That one's actually relatively easy. The hard part is selling it at the right time. Because what's most likely going to happen is you're going to get too confident and too euphoric and you're going to ride it. It's going to go way up and you're going to feel like a genius. And then you're going to ride it all the way back down. 
Yep. I mean, it's true for stocks too. I have some uh, acts still sitting in my account from like, I don't know, 2000, from 2021, I think. Yeah, exactly. There was one, uh, I'm blanking on what the old name was, but they changed their symbol to A-T-E-R. They like renamed themselves. They were like a $4 stock that went to like 55. They were like, they sold like products online, like bidets and like just random stuff. And it was like, yeah. the narrative was just so there that like this, this company is going, you know, here are all the co- comparable companies. And it's like, like I actually got in at around four yeah. and it wrote it all the way to 55 and it went down to four cents. And then they did like a reverse split or something. So it's sitting mm-hmm. at 40 cents, but I have like 10 shares instead of a hundred. And it's like, you know, you're totally right. Knowing when to sell is actually way harder because the time you should sell is actually the time it sounds like you should not sell. Exactly. Like it's when everything looks like it's going right. And I have have like a whole chapter in there on this, like a mini chapter about it. Because it's like, that is so hard. And, you know, it's impossible. It is impossible to buy, to buy and sell at the right amount because it's like, if you if it goes up and you made money, you're gonna feel like, oh, I should have bought more. Yep. And if let's say it kept going up, like at least you made money in that case. But if you if you hold on to it too long, and like what I did with that one stock, or you know, probably many people have done with meme coins or other things, it's like you're gonna really feel like an idiot. Oh yeah, <laughs> like you're well, like, the- oh, I knew it was too good to be true. Totally. When you know they were talking about this company that just basically drop ships products from China becoming like a $20 billion company, like no chance. And I think, yeah, well, and I think that, you know, it's, it's understandable that people do that too, because the prevailing investment wisdom is buy and hold, don't panic sell, you know, you just keep buying and wait. And that is excellent advice for index funds. But if you're playing with something that's hyper volatile and has a decent chance of going to zero, you can't follow those rules, yeah. right? Or like, like you know, a typical rebalancing, typical rebalancing guidance would be, you know, don't sell your winners, just buy more of the things that are lagging so that it balances out over time. But like, that's also terrible advice in this type of environment because your winners might just be like at their temporary euphoria and be going all the way back down. And you, you have to have rules in place. Like literally the only thing that saved me I would have lost way more money than I did if I hadn't done a like net worth analysis at one point. And because I, I felt like I felt like I was getting unbalanced. And then I started going through all of my accounts and said, okay, what do I have in my 401k? What do I have in cash? What do I have in, you know, my regular investment fund? What do I have in crypto? And it was something like 70% crypto. <laughs> like, yeah, okay. the, it was worth more than our real estate portfolio it was worth more than all of our retirement accounts and index funds it was worth more than everything and i was sort of like this is probably stupid i should <laughs> try to get that down <laughs> and that was when i started selling more aggressively and that was in like march of 22 which wasn't the best time to start selling but it was way better than if i had waited a few more months yeah yeah. Yeah. And I think if you're going to dabble, I think your advice makes a ton of sense. It's like, I mean, honestly, it's probably the same thing in the stock market. Like if you're going to dabble, an index fund is great. Yeah. And Bitcoin is in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, for all the other yeah. things that Bitcoin does, this is like not obviously the main selling point. But in, in a lot of ways, it is sort of like the index fund oh, totally. of, of crypto. Yeah. I mean, Bitcoin's been 40 to 50 percent of the total crypto market cap for years and years and years and years and years. Like. I think it's unlikely that it would go back up to 60, 70, 80%, but it's also really unlikely that it would go down to 30% or 20% or something. You know, if you're. Yeah, I mean, something would have to happen probably. Something have really to be bad like would have to happen. Some real yeah. catalyst. Toshi wallets move and dump it once or something, you know. We find out it was DARPA all along. It's something absurd, yeah. some crazy. Honestly, terrorists. at this point, I'm not, I'm not actually sure that. That might not matter anymore. It was the yeah, government. Yeah. Like, it wouldn't actually be. I mean, I think it could be the government actually behind it, but like. I don't actually necessarily know now that all the institutional money is starting to come in, if that would actually be like a bad thing. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's I think it's grown past the point of that being a serious that would be risk. Bad. Yeah, if, if, it was, hackable, if it was a real hack, really bad, obviously. Be real. But that that's pretty much the risk at this point, too. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I actually there. I mean, think about Satoshi's wallet that has been sitting there since the beginning. 
the money hasn't yeah. moved. That is like the biggest honeypot for a hacker. Like if you could hack it, like somebody I feel like would have hacked that at this point. I feel like the actual big black swan risk is a security failure at Coinbase mm-hmm. because yeah. a- at the end of the day, all of this crypto is still accessible with the right private key. So if somebody found a way to get Coinbase's private keys, and I mean, all of BlackRock's money is gone, all of Coinbase's money is gone, all of Fidelity's money is gone, like all of the, all of the crypto is gone. And th- that would just be the end. <laughs> I, don't, I mean, maybe I don't, I don't know enough about Bitcoin structure to, to know if this is possible or not. Like in Ethereum, you could reorg the chain, just wipe all of that out. I mean, that would be an awful thing to have to do, but it is possible with enough consensus. I guess you could do that in Bitcoin too with enough consensus. You can consensus. do a fork. You can do yeah, a hard do a fork. fork, yeah. I mean, that. I guess you would probably have to do that, but that would be such a brutal event to happen. I mean, that would destroy the lore of... Totally, totally. Of, oh, we never, you know, that's yeah. never happened. And, uh, although yeah. it, it did happen. It did happen in Bitcoin's early days and it happened in Ethereum. The Mt. Gox. Oh, before that, the infinite printing hack with mm. uh, Bitcoin where... I not... I need to I need to read up so I can explain it better on podcasts. It was really early, like 2010, I think, and they had to do a, a fork to repair it. Um, but then, yeah, Ethereum had the Mt. Gox hack, and they did the fork to repair that. Um, and I actually feel like it, we we would talk about this in in DeFi a lot when I was doing more smart contract work. That it was actually much safer to use a project that had been hacked than one that hadn't. Mm. Because actually makes sense. If they've already gone through the big hack, then they're probably like the big risk is hopefully off the table. Whereas a project that's never been hacked, there's this sense of like, okay, there might still be one coming to be worried yeah. about. I mean, something I learned from your book that I did not know before is how much of this these hacks are basically bots that yeah. are just scanning for holes in these smart contracts. Uh, I always assumed, you know, we watch movies and TV and stuff, and it's like, there's a guy at his computer being like, I found one. Like, right? There's a lot of that something. too. Yeah. yeah. But some of it is just like, because there, there are certain common errors in smart contracts and you can just run automated checks on any contract in the wild and see if it has one of those errors. And if it does, like, boom, you got money. Yep. Yeah. And it's like just continuously checking, you know, and yeah. somebody's just collecting. Yeah. I mean, like the error you made was publishing your private key in yeah. the contract, which seems like it must be common enough that a bot like somebody's written a bot to check for that yeah I, i'm I'm certain that what happened is that there are people who have bots that scan new github repos to see if they have solidity code in them and if they do have solidity code to look for anything that matches a private key and yep. then once they find one to just go drain that wallet because that wouldn't be a terribly complicated bot to put together and it could be incredibly profitable whenever you find something i mean it's cost next to nothing to run and what yeah. if, you know you can get thirty five thousand dollar bounties from that yeah and the, the thing that was shocking when that happened to me is i ended up sharing the story on twitter and so many other professional solidity engineers came in and said oh yeah this exact same thing happened to me when i started or i made this other similar error it was par for the course for anybody who started coding on ethereum to have something like that happen to them yeah, And I mean, that was why back then there were a lot fewer Solidity engineers. There was something like less than 10,000 on active on GitHub at the time. And there were no courses on how to do it. So you, it was really the wild west of learning how to do that kind of programming. And then you, you add how hard it is to learn with the fear that you might just lose all of your money in the right. process. <laughs> it was pretty brutal. So your point about being full time, like you have to be full time in it would I want to dive into that a little bit because mm-hmm. uh, something I did not realize, and maybe you can also elaborate on how this works. It seems like people who were doing this full time and like truly in it would basically move money into a project. And you were specifically talking about DeFi in yeah. in, uh, in most of the book, not all the book, but a lot of the book. People would move money in and it would be very like quick. Like You would look at to see how things are going. And then when you notice things are not behaving the way that you would want them to behave or that would indicate the project is continuing to, you know, still kind of be in an upward trend. You'd pull your money out. I guess like the, I didn't realize the pace of how quickly that happens. You know, it seemed like sometimes it was like within a day or hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the other thing is like, who are the people on the other side of that trade? Like when you're selling, who's buying at that point? Or is it like unsophisticated people or like what's the, cause I guess, you know, with a DeFi or a, or a um, 
decentralized exchange, like isn't there's there is a buyer on the other side or there's not necessarily there's not. It's just so the exchange. Well, yeah. So there, there's there's a couple important things here. So one, you know, crypto has these different manias within crypto, right? So when we're recording right now, the big one is all of these meme coins on Solana, where people are just launching silly shit, and you've got the politician coins, you've got whatever thing is in the news, you've got just a lot of silly tokens, all of the like Doge derivatives. And that's kind of what people are gambling on. When I when the stuff was going on in the book, the big mania was these DeFi farms. A in in sort of the simple version is a new a new project. I say that in quotes because they often weren't real projects. <laughs> they would launch and they would say, "Hey, uh, we're launching the new like system decks, and if you provide funds to our new exchange, we'll give you our system tokens." And the more funds you provide, the more system tokens you get. And you and that's how you can like farm tokens. You know, I put my money into your new project. You give me a stream of tokens. And then what people would usually do is they would then take those tokens and either redeposit them because then they could earn even more tokens or they would, you know, go sell them to cash out. So then we get to the second question of like, who's the buyer, right? And when you sell on a decentralized exchange, the immediate buyer is the exchange because the exchange has a pool of, say, like system and ETH. And you can put an infinite number of system tokens into it and it will spit out ETH based on the current exchange rate within that pair. So if there's 100 system and 10 ETH and then you put in another 100 system, you'll get like half of the ETH or like some smaller amount. But now there's 200 system and five ETH. So if you put in another 100, your exchange rate's way lower because system is worth a lot less because there's way more system relative to the amount of ETH in the DEX now. And so you can you can theoretically make the trade you know, an infinite amount, but the amount you're getting paid is going down, 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 down. So the only way system gets worth more is if people are going to the DEX and putting in ETH to get the system tokens back. And so then you're then you wonder like well why would anybody do that right like this is clearly kind of a shit project that people are just milking for money that and they're going to dump it well people would buy the tokens because they could get more tokens by buying tokens and so it was just a game you know you you were basically playing somewhere between poker and chicken with everybody else who was playing of how high can we get this to go before everybody chickens and sells everything so you get in early, you farm a bunch of these tokens, and then everybody else starts to think it's going to go higher and higher and higher. They'll come in and they'll buy your tokens so they can play the game. And then it's just a question of who's going to move first and who's going to sell, and are you going to get out more money than you put into it? And that was basically the game. And that's the game with most meme coins too. Because everybody knows these are going to zero. Well, not everybody. The smart money knows these are going to zero eventually. And they're like, okay, what can I get in at? Where can I get out at um, to try to like ride this hype? You're but, saying Joe Bowden won't be a uh, legal tender? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that, you know, that that's an interesting one, right? Because there you you could construct a narrative here that through the elections, the pol- the politician coins are going to get stupider and stupider and people are going to fight over what goes higher in value, right? Bowden or Trump, right? Like you can see that game playing out. So that one might be worth staying in for longer. But there are these other ones that just last a day. And so you get in and get out. But with these farms, the more money you put into them, the more tokens you would earn. So the quicker you could compound your earnings usually. And you would have some that would launch on a Monday. There'd be over $100 million in them by Tuesday. And then by Thursday or Friday, it's under $5 million. Wow. Because the game is over. And somebody probably made a million dollars or more off of that. And a lot of people might have made, you know, 5, 10, 20% returns. And then a lot of people lost money. But they're going to keep playing because they know that if they time the next farm, right, they could be the one who makes all of the money. And so it was just this, this kind of like competitive PVP game of who could time their ins and outs the best. How early could you find out something was launching so you get in before other people? You know, how much do you compound your earnings versus take winnings off the table? It was a pretty crazy game well that was another thing that you highlighted in the book that i didn't 
I, I always assumed something like that was happening. And, you know, you see people tweeting about it or selling access to their private groups and stuff like that. But I didn't realize like how much of the alpha comes from people in private groups being like, oh, I'm in on this other thing and like check yeah. that out. And then you get in and you're one of the early ones. And, you know, also, I guess with how little liquidity is in these markets, those groups can sometimes create the demand. They do. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, they often do it deliberately. So that's one of the things that's going on now with the meme coins on Solana is all of the ones that do well. It's because there are these private group chats where people will coordinate 10, 15, 20 million or more to all get put into it at the beginning. So there's enough liquidity for it to do well. And then they're all buying it up initially. And then that creates the initial surge. And then other people find out about it and they follow it in. But the insiders who got it started, they're pretty much guaranteed to make money because it won't go below the price that they added the initial liquidity at. So it's a somewhat, it's not entirely riskless, but it's a much lower risk game for them than for anybody following them after. So if you are not either in those kinds of private chats where you're finding out about stuff as it's launching or before it launches, and you're finding stuff on Twitter, you're usually the exit liquidity because you're coming in to a game that's rigged against you from the start. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I guess insider trading also, because I guess how much... So that's maybe a follow-up question. Like, how much of this is being done by the insiders? Like somebody who's, let's say, starting a project, let's put it in quotes, uh, not necessarily a project, but just any meme... You know, I spit up NatCoin today, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like... Is it is is the best marketing move for me to find these private groups and be like, or, or give somebody like a pre mine or something, or I don't even know if that's what's called, but just basically incentivize people to talk about the project to get yeah, or, or dumb to find money people in, to or... coordinate initial liquidity with yeah, right. So because the the main thing people will look at is how much you know real money like USDC or Solana or ETH is backing this token and. The more of that you have, the more other people will often go into it. But the only way you get that is by finding these other people who can provide it. And then they're getting tokens at that like floor launch price. Yep. So that's the, you know, if you're going to launch a token, that's the best way to do it. Because then all of those people will be bought in from the ground floor. And assuming they have Twitter audiences or other private groups, they're going to share it there. And it's not necessarily... their people will bring in their own money Exactly. Yeah. And it's not necessarily nefarious, you know, it's it's a gray line of when it goes from helping your friends out to turning people into exit liquidity because nobody knows when it's going to crash, right. right? And so people will share things with other people because, you know, I might be like helping my friend make a bunch of money. And this was actually one reason I for a while I would talk about projects that I was interested in on Twitter and in my Discord and stuff and it ended up, I, I ended up kind of regretting it because I would get into something and I would go in pretty early because I had, you know, ears on the ground, but then I would do more research and get more comfortable with it and like figure out if it actually seemed good or not. And then I would talk about it, but that would be like a two, three, four week lag. And in that time period, it often would have like run up a bunch. And so I was actually sharing the information too late mm. for it to be like, good for other people to go into anymore but i didn't want to share it the minute i was interested because i didn't really know if it was good or not right like it, it was this kind of like tough trade-off um of having any influence in the space like you're you're trying to be helpful but also sometimes you're being unhelpful by like waiting to share things it's kind of a weird the incentives are weird on it yeah um pivoting to nfts uh yeah, yeah. which it's funny because I remember how big those were, but I'd kind of forgotten about them a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'd totally forgot about them, but they've just definitely fallen out of, you know, kind yeah. of the mainstream. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there was a time it's like every company, it, there was like, a, there was a time where every like company was trying to launch an NFT as well. Like, do you think there's long, like any, uh, is there like a comeback for NFTs? Not, not just from like a mania perspective, but I remember like all the utility that was being talked about, like for gaming, for example, right? Like having an object in a game that you could then resell. I, I still use this app, even though, you know, the tokens are not worth what they what they were. But Steppin, right? Like the shoe yeah. was an NFT and you could 
theoretically play the game and then resell this, you know, level up the shoe and resell it to somebody else. Like in theory, it makes a lot of like it actually sounds great totally. like, from a yeah, game yeah. perspective. It I mean that I mean, yes, that's definitely going to come back and that's definitely going to be a thing. There, there's really no question that some like that seems type to of, be real. there's yeah. real utility there. Well, and that we know that that's real because people have been doing it for decades without yeah. good rails for it. People yeah. who were playing World of Warcraft and Dota and EVE Online and all of these games would pay thousands of dollars for items that were purely cosmetic. You know, RuneScape had the party hats people would pay thousands of dollars for. Like, this is something that people already do. If people spend billions of dollars a year on Fortnite skins. All of those assets are locked in the game and are not... Uh, you can't take them out of the game and you often can't resell them within the game. But if Fortnite had a marketplace where you could, like, sell your skins... People would do it all the time. Fortnite could probably charge a 30% transaction fee or something on it if they wanted to. And NFTs and crypto rails would be the natural way to do it because that would be the easiest way to get money in and out of the ecosystem. And if I, you know, I have like the Nat Eliasson dot ETH um, ENS, you know, like name tag basically. And if somebody could just look at that and see all of my achievements and skins and assets from like a variety of games... That's something gamers would really enjoy because they like having these status symbols. Yep. And that's gonna that's a very natural way for it to happen. What I think became problematic and you know why there's a, a bit of a smudge on that is they became purely means of speculation, right? Like Dota 2, the popular computer video game, actually lets you resell your cosmetics. They have a yeah. marketplace and it's all priced in USD. And you have like a, a wallet within the game and you can buy and sell your assets. Most of them are like $3, right? That's what this stuff is actually worth for the most part. An ultra rare one, yes, might be worth $10,000, but most of them are not worth much. But during this, this NFT mania, every NFT was worth thousands of dollars. And they were launching them for games that had no players or hadn't even right. been out yet. And that aspect of it, is stupid. But if you have a, you know, Fortnite season one rare skin, that might be worth a few hundred dollars because people will pay that much to get it. But every Fortnite item being worth thousands of dollars, like that's never going to happen. That's just silly. So the, the mania side of it will go away, but the, the tech as a way to, you know, turn gaming items into broader status symbols, that's definitely going to become a thing. Why, why does Fortnite... A not do this or B like do they even need to do do this with crypto? Like what's to stop them from just starting like a Apple App Store ver like equivalent, right? And just charging dollars for it. Is there a they, reason they, for it to be the main be, like yeah. Yeah, the main reason would be so that it's easier for people to bring money in and out of the ecosystem and to be plugged into a like broader world of these gaming status symbols. Easier if the game is yeah yeah because then they don't have to worry about like merchant fees and like vat tax and you know do you have to, like country issue 1099s rights and like and, yeah country yeah. all this stuff like it's just a digital asset you know on blockchain people can use usdc anywhere in the world it'll settle instantly they don't have to worry about like visa and mastercard processing fees and so they could totally just do it themselves but they'd be kind of like locked out of the broader ecosystem and i think that it will become pretty appealing to be a part of that broader ecosystem kind of like you know a, a game could handle their multiplayer completely on their own but they choose to instead plug into like xbox live and playstation live because it's easier for that global network to let people find their existing friends and let people share their achievements on their like xbox gamer tag not just their hell divers 2 gamer tag like, i think that composability across the ecosystem is very appealing and then you add on like there there is a casino chip aspect to it where if people have a few thousand dollars on chain already and they can just like one click send that into fortnite and then buy items with it and they don't have to do a new transaction in fortnite to add money to their wallet there you're going to get a lot more transactions yeah right which is what they want at the end of which the day which is what they want yeah yeah, uh, actually, that brings up a good point about taxes. Like, you have a whole section about taxes God, yeah. in this book. Like, 
how painful was that process? <laughs> Cause it sounds yeah, so painful. It sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the first problem is that the rules aren't clear and the IRS hasn't made the rules very clear. It, it is for certain things. Hmm? Yeah. Classic. Yeah. It, it's, it is for certain things. If you buy ETH at one price and you sell it at another price, you have to pay capital gains on it. Like you would a stock. But then all of this stuff in DeFi land and NFT land, there aren't rules for. It. So if you, you know, there, there's a, a product called Aave, A-A-V-E, where you can deposit your ETH and you earn some more ETH and interest for, you know, having that in this like big lending pool. And you could borrow USDC against it. You know, it's a way to like leverage your assets. But when you deposit ETH into Aave, Aave gives you something called AETH, which is an Aave ETH receipt. And that token sits in your wallet. It is technologically no different from any other token like USDC, except that you know it's fundamentally valueless. It's just a receipt for the ETH that you deposited into Aave. However, the transaction that you did by depositing ETH and getting AETH back, it looks like a taxable event. It looks like you did a trade. It looks like you sold your ETH for A ETH. And so you should now have to pay capital gains on however the price of ETH changed between when you bought it and when you made that deposit. Now, you and I know that's silly because yeah. you're not selling it. It's just you're, you're depositing it and you have a receipt. But does the IRS understand that? Unclear. And could you even explain this to them if they came back and they said you had 5,000 taxable events that you did not classify, right? Like, it's like, no, I did. Like, those aren't taxable events. Those are deposits. And they say, eh, it looks like a taxable event to us. You know, what do you do there? Right. <laughs> or, you know, there's, there's other things like, you know, in order to help secure the Ethereum network, you can do what's called staking your ETH, where the short version is you're pledging your ETH to the network. And if you or who you've delegated it to tries to cheat the network, the network will just take some of that ETH away. But in return for pledging that ETH, you get a, you know, like a, a certain APR. It's like three and a half or 4% now. So you can stake your ETH and just get 4% on your ETH for helping secure the network, which is great. The way that you get that interest, though, sometimes it's just a token in your wallet that's going up every day. Like every day you're getting a little additional amount of this token. But is that income? Is that a dividend? Is that a stock split? Like, there's no rules for this. And so how do you report it, right? It's, it's totally unclear what the rules are there. And so you're kind of stuck making your best guess. And, you know, I talk about this in the book, depending on how I calculated it, it was six figure differences in my tax bill. And some people would just say, yeah, screw it. I'm only going to pay taxes on what I actually took out of crypto. And that seems really risky, right? That's like yeah. crazy talk. Other people would be would say like I'm going to go as crazy safe as possible, assume everything's a taxable transaction, and pay max taxes, and that seems wrong too, right? So everybody had to kind of pick what they were comfortable with, and then make their best case for it. And like I don't know, the IRS could come back in five years and say, "Hey, you did this wrong, and now we need to like audit all of your crypto transactions." Like I hope they didn't do that. I was definitely on the like safer end where I said, like, I'm just going to assume a lot of things are taxable and just pay the bill. I mean, I ended up having to write a $450,000 check to the IRS, which is like fucking awful (laughs) because I wasn't prepared for it too. Like I didn't have the money. I had locked a bunch of it up. I had lost a bunch of it. And so I I had to sell all this other shit just to pay my tax bill, which is, you know, a nightmare of its own. But I, you know, it, to me, I was like, you know, it's not worth being worried about going to jail or having some awful tax bill in the future. I'm just going to pay this shit and try to be smarter next time. But I know a lot of people who said it's almost they're not going to figure it out. Like, it's fine. I mean, it's almost like you <laughs> wrote a big enough check that you would hope that they would just be like, OK, yeah, this guy probably did it right. Let's go after exactly. the people that didn't pay anything. Yeah. You know? yeah. There's no way you look at that amount and go, this guy's trying to cheat. it. I mean, maybe they will. Like, I hope they don't. But it was like, I'm going to give my best guess and overpay, I could, pro- I probably could have gotten away with paying a third of that, right? I personally don't think this is how it works, but I'll just say it anyway. I, I don't think they think like this, but if they were thinking nefariously, 
Mm -hmm. they would look at the 450 and be like, there's probably more where that came from. Let's go find (laughs) that. Like, I'm sure you've seen these stats. The, the two, the two groups that are most likely to be audited are people who make over 2 million a year and people who make under 80 K a year. Yeah. Seems crazy that that gets taxed. Yeah. I saw this one. uh, I forget. It's it's, again, some tweet, honestly, like, Public policy should be based on probably not actually based on Twitter, but there are some good, there are honestly some good proposals where, like, I saw this thing and I was like, until somebody is, if someone is under 40 or under 40 years old, does not own real estate and has a net worth under like 250,000 or something, like, they should not pay any income tax. Like, basically, yeah. like, help people get a nest egg, like, or at mm-hmm. least a little bit of, of, like, on their feet, basically, before. You start pulling money out of their um, yeah. paycheck, and I don't think that'll ever happen. But it kind of does make some sense. Like, why would you know? Like, it's probably like people. I know that there's all those studies of like, oh, you don't, you're not happier with like making more money after a certain point or whatever. But it's like there is even in those same studies, there's plenty of evidence that up to that point, actually, money does make your life better and less stressful. Totally. You know, frankly, it's like probably leads to people making better long term decisions when they're not living paycheck to paycheck. Nick Majuli, he's of dollars and data on Twitter. He he had a thing that actually really changed my mind about wealth taxes because I was generally, you know, very against wealth taxes. And I think they still have a lot of implementation challenges. But he made the argument that there should be no tax on capital gains until your net worth is like a million dollars. And then there should be kind of a scaling wealth tax over a hundred million or something like that. Because then it makes it way easier for people to get up to this baseline level of wealth. And then as it gets like to these crazy numbers, then it starts to like taper off and come back down. And because that makes it, again, as easy as possible for people to like get to the starting line of serious wealth creation. And it doesn't punish them for the ride like up to that point, which I think lets them get there faster. And lets them get there faster. Totally. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I don't think, again, this will ever happen, but like if the point of long-term capital gains versus short-term capital gains, like the classification difference and the tax rate difference is to incentivize long-term holding behavior, there should be another tier of long-term that's even lower, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. five years, 10 years, years, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I guess that's retirement funds, right? Because retirement funds are zero. Yeah. 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 No, I guess that's true. Uh, But there's, yeah, I don't know. It just feels very arbitrary that it's like, it's like zero to one or one to infinity, basically. Yeah. Or one, (laughs) like a scaling something. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. Which I don't even know what is the purpose of long-term capital gains to incentivize long-term holding. I, I I actually wouldn't know what the original. It must be. It must be. Yeah. To discourage like day trading or. Yeah. Or discourage financialization. Right. Yeah. Like, in, in which case, you know, it, I, it, I might even be in favor of, you know, an ultra high capital gains tax on single day trades, right? Like zero day to expiry options should have a 90% cap gains tax. To and then discourage people, the volatility yeah. that those can create. Yeah, exactly. That would hurt high frequency trading too, which I'm sure there's an argument for high frequency trading, making the market more efficient, but it's also like so many man hours and so much intellect has gone into something that so provides many almost people. no value to society that yeah yeah i wouldn't be totally against making that way more expensive to do yeah like the number of smart people spending their time on uh high frequency trading and getting people to click on ads right? exactly it's basically like <laughs> so many of the smart the things people we could build the planets we could colonize <laughs> yep the infinite energy sources. Wait, we could have yeah. a Dyson Sphere by now, but yeah. <laughs> instead we're laying cable from Chicago to New York to shave 100 milliseconds off a tree. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, trying to figure out the next way to get eyes to an ad, you know. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, hey, it's worked really, really well. Those Both of those industries have done very well. Yeah, hey, Timu yeah. is thriving. <laughs> yeah. Have you bought anything from there? No. No, I assume that anything I you buy will just like, like fall fair. apart as soon as you open the box. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have in our in our apartment we have this like little outdoor space, and like obviously being uh, in the Northeast, there's not a ton of months of great weather. Yeah, and we were like trying to think about what to buy out there, and we literally just went with the super cheap like, Walmart, you know, table shipped straight from China because we were like, yeah, you know, we need it to last three months. 
basically yeah, in the northeast. Yeah. It's basically renting it for three months. So we'll, we'll invest in something nicer when you know we have a more permanent place. But yeah, but it's like a lot of the cheap goods that are out there. And it's so funny when I made that search, you know, it was like outdoor table under a hundred dollars. Then it was Timu, Wayfair, like all these, yeah, yeah. you know, well, it's like, for- uh, that's what me and Cosette do with our rugs because we have two dogs and two toddlers. And yep. so, and we're just <laughs> it's like, not yeah, a long-term rug. Yeah. cheapest, whatever that looks okay. And isn't full of plastic. <laughs> that's yep. good enough for us. We'll get the nice fancy rugs later. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually a good, honestly, a good strategy. The one thing that is bad, I mean, this is total tangent, but one thing that's bad that I looked into after buying a bunch of like some cheap stuff, um, all the manufactured wood uh, products, they're all like basically like sawdust and formaldehyde is basically what they're made from. And the the fire retardants are really bad. And yeah, you're you're basically sitting on plastic. But yeah, so we in our battles. Well, yeah, what we did is like in our bedroom, we didn't buy anything like that. Yeah to be like breathing it in while you're sleeping and then some like common area stuff that like is not going to be like a long-term thing like we got a nice tv console that was real wood and because i think we'll you know keep that like long term but like we got a crappy coffee table because like the way our space is laid out like it's not a great space for like a great coffee table that we like so we were like okay we'll just get something cheap here that yeah you know works for now but that's manufactured wood bed sheets and your underwear aren't full of plastic that's like 80 percent of the battle yeah yeah (laughs) yeah i do think there is some like neuroticism about this i saw uh somebody was talking about like and obviously it depends what sphere of or circle you're in like yeah there's plenty i would say the vast majority of americans are not in this sphere but if you're on like the health twitter sphere there's like a collective Munchausen syndrome a little bit too, which I'm starting to believe in um like yes every there is a lot of stuff that's poisoned out there but at the same time, like, as you said, there's like eight, you can get 80% of the way there pretty quickly. Like you don't need to become insane. I, mean, the, the, for I think this is fundamentally a problem of like short form media and the need to generate content. Because like, if you're a health influencer, you need shit to tweet about and make videos <laughs> about and post on your story. And you can't like just explain you know, ancestral diet every day, people are going to get bored of that. So you start, you have to start like coming up with crazier and crazier and crazier things to get people to keep watching your shit. <laughs> also the way people cite studies in, uh, in health influencer Twitter is oh, hilarious. Best. It'll be like study shows, like blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, this thing causes, you know, whatever kind of cancer. Yeah. And then yep. you, you, if you actually like click on the link, it'll be like, this study was done on five mice in China. Yeah, yeah. Plunges is my favorite version of that because you have all these health influencers saying that like cold plunges have been proven to do X, Y, and Z. And there has been like two studies done on 10 people. And that's like <laughs> the bedrock of all of the cold plunge science. And look, cold, I think cold plunge science is silly too because all you have to do is do one. And it's really obvious that it's doing something great for you. And it feels but really then, good. It, honestly, you feel incredible but, after, yeah. right? Yeah. Like this isn't, a, you don't need a, a research paper to tell you that you feel good after you do it. But everyone's like, oh, it's been proven that it's so good for you. It's like, no, no it hasn't. I mean, <laughs> it's like it's like needing a study to tell you you feel good after a good night's sleep. Exactly. Or the, uh, doing, my like, favorite is the, uh, the study on the proof of efficacy of parachutes in sudden airplane exit situations or something. <laughs> Have you seen that one? It was like a no. satirical research paper that somebody published about how like when the control group was given no parachutes and the test group was given. It's like, yeah, you don't need to study all the time. Yeah. And also like you can, uh, a lot of people don't do this for some reason. I, I don't know why. I don't know what the, I don't know. I've always kind of, this is how I've always thought. I know I, you're even the next level than that, but I, I think you can just try stuff and like, yeah, see how it works for you. <laughs> Cause different things sure. will work for different people. Like, you know, caffeine works great for some people. Caffeine does not work for some people and like gives them really bad effects. Like same thing with alcohol, same thing with nicotine, same thing yeah. with you know, cold plunges probably like maybe there's some people that don't do well with that. And, you know, also all of us have different levels of like underlying stuff. You know, maybe like if you're really fit and have every stuff, all your other stuff together, like you go in a sauna and you come out and you feel good. Maybe if you're like super inflamed and you go in a sauna, maybe that's not going to work so well for you or maybe it will. I don't know. Totally. Um, Just try stuff. But like, yeah. see what happens. <laughs> the, 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 the area where I feel like it is really important to get that research is the stuff that you just have no idea is yeah, secretly you killing tell. you, right? Yeah. 
Yep. Like, you know, having all the, having like plastic in the drinking water, right? Like, yep. anything notice like, it and anything day. like cancer, because you have like an N equals one, like you can't be like, did this give me cancer or not? Right. right? Like right. that's a tough one um, to, to check for, because like by yeah. the time you have it, it's a little bit too late. The long-term stuff, you might not notice that you feel any different, but then it catches up to you 30 years later. I think yeah. it's also like noticing those signs of like, okay, something doesn't feel good in general and then just taking a step back and like the whole elimination thing makes a lot of sense i actually honestly think that's like like i'm definitely not carnivore and i don't think i could i like too many non-meat things as i love meat but i like plenty of other things as well i do think one thing they do get right that is that's like probably a good idea but then they kind of stop there is like elimination right you're kind of eliminating like a lot of other stuff and I think that's why a lot back. of these extreme diets have such great short-term effects is just because you're like naturally eliminating a lot of the junk, right? Yeah. Like, cause if you go on a vegan diet, most people feel awesome when they start on a vegan diet too. Right. But and like same thing with carnivore, but then a lot of people end up starting to feel bad later. Right. It's like even a lot of the big carnivore influencers have changed the definition of carnivore over time as they started to like feel bad on the diet right yeah it used to be just eating meat and now it's like well you can have fruit too and coconut water is yeah coconut water (laughs) (laughs) oh yeah no yeah also it's um so much of it too is just like your mindset i actually like this sounds woo woo but it's like i think mindset makes a bit plays a big role in it totally uh I I would never have expected that the two countries with the longest life expectancy are Japan. I feel like everybody knows, okay, yeah, Japanese people live a long time. But the second one is Spain. Yeah. It's like Spain drinks a lot. They eat Eat a a lot lot of a lot of red meat, processed meats, although their processing is how we do it. But a lot of time in the sun. A lot of time in the sun. Very different than the Yeah. But they have like, you know, they they sleep during the day. There's, you know, kind of a relaxed lifestyle in general. I, but, I, yeah. I'm pretty of the mind now that it's all stress. Yeah. Like, I think almost, I, I don't think that there's anything you can do to your diet that makes up for being very stressed and sleep deprived. Yeah. And if you're well rested and not stressed, I think you can get away with like almost anything short of alcoholism and meth. Like... <laughs> Because actually, that's another thing you notice in Japan and in Japan and Spain. Like I was just in Spain a few weeks ago. Like the um, the smoking rates are like feel like what they are in Japan, and it's like yeah, you know, all of our studies around smoking in America are like smoking is really bad, like kills you unequivocally, like proven. Yep. Uh, but then it doesn't. I mean, maybe it has the same effect there, but their other stuff is so on point that like it it's a marginal difference to them. It's totally. like it's almost like the baseline level of stress determines how much other stress your body can handle i think part of it yeah Yeah. because like if you're if you're really stressed out and then you're adding these physical stressors on top of it you're like you can't do it totally but if you're pretty relaxed and then you have some of these other little stressors then you can handle it it's like yeah yeah this is fine i can handle it yeah Yeah, it's uh so actually this is this is a question i wanted to ask you because it's related to the book now Still a tangent, but related okay. to the book. The sleepless, the sleeplessness of the crypto stress versus yeah. the sleeplessness of having a newborn. Because now you've gone through it a second time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, is the first time they were probably combined. Like you had both yeah. stresses yeah, yeah. going on. The second time, I assume you just had the newborn. The sleeplessness related to the newborn. And maybe not sleeplessness, but just like the schedule um, yeah, yeah, irregularity. Schedule. Are the, do those feel very, very different? Because at least in my imagination, I mean, I know what work stress feels like or money stress feels like. I would imagine like newborn stress is like it's stressful, but it's still like positive stress or do they feel the yeah. same? Yeah, no, new, newborn, you know, people talk about sleeplessness with a newborn a lot, but it's kind of weird. And I think it's because your body knows that it's really important for you to be on this weird sleep schedule. And so it's never that bad. Like it's, it's weirdly tolerable to have a completely messed up sleep schedule for those four months. Yeah. And I think it's because your body knows that you like need a little extra help right now to take care of this thing. And it's going to give you that, boost from somewhere right like it's kind of woo and whatever but i think it's true from having experienced it a couple times whereas if it's sleeplessness from work you're just getting jerked around by you know 
an environment that isn't like cute and loving you <laughs> and <laughs> it's just kind of like shitty i mean it can be exciting too because you know some of the sleeplessness is you're waking up in the middle of the night to like claim your farming rewards and you're making money right. and it's like yeah we're doing it let's go <laughs> but it's it's definitely it has that like caffeinated strung out feeling to it that the newborn sleeplessness doesn't yeah you also mentioned, I think you told me this once, it's like you guys never, you and Cosette never get sick at the same time as the kids. It's yeah, like, yeah. It happens like one after the other. That's a common thing that I hear from other parents too. Is, yeah. And I mean, and I think that, you know, like I think people understand this intuitively on some level that you can have a virus or whatever in you for a bit and then your body waits for the right time to like fight it off. Because you hear this happen in other situations too. People finish their finals in college and then they get sick. They go on vacation and then they get sick. Like the holidays come around and then they get sick. And I don't think it's just that you're going into a situation where there are other people that you're catching it. I think it's that once you like relax, then your body's like, okay, now I have the energy to like fight this thing off and fully get rid of it. And so that's when it turns on the fever and makes you rest more and do all those things so that it can like fight the disease and yeah every time the kids have gotten sick like one of us will be sick at the same time as the kids and the other one won't be and then once everyone's recovered the other one will get sick and that's just been consistent for the last two and a half years and i think it's pretty common in other households too yeah that happened to me over the holidays this year it was like I was looking forward to finally relaxing, and then I immediately yep. got sick right after Christmas. Like, I was like, yeah. oh, between, like, after we do the family stuff, like, we're just going to be relaxing. And then it's like, nope. Second we got back, it's like, shit, I'm getting sick. Relaxing more than you expected. <laughs> um, I did watch all the Harry Potter movies again, though, yeah. which is good. I, go. I hadn't watched them, like, in probably since they came out, like, each one. Nice. So it was a rewatch. It was actually like, good, like, because I know what's going to happen. You don't need yeah, to pay yeah. full attention. It was actually kind of nice from that perspective. It wasn't fun being sick, but and you probably chill. learned some spells along the way. I right? did, but <laughs> um, well, I got two more writing related questions. Yeah, so-, so you you've told me this, uh, and I think you mentioned it. I made you think you studied fiction writing mm-hmm. uh, as you were writing this book, and you know, I think we can talk about this too. Like you've gotten a lot more into writing fiction itself, but. What kind of led to that decision? Because I know I know plenty of nonfiction book writers. You you don't hear about a lot of people being like, "I'm actually going to sit down and study how stories are told." You know, maybe the best ones do that, but it was somewhat uncommon. Like I hadn't heard that before. And, you know, you kind of really went down that rabbit hole, and then that also led you to actually now writing, truly writing fiction. Yeah, uh, yeah. What motivated that? Like, did you have an initial draft that you were like getting some feedback on and? People said, yeah, the story is not flowing or was it you just being yeah, like, that, I, yeah, that's basically it. I, you know, I sort of had, I had my rough outline and I had a kind of shitty first draft of the book in progress and I was getting more and more of the opinion that it needed to, I knew I had to explain some complicated technical concepts. And so I knew that the story around it had to be really exciting and really fun to pull people through those explanations. And so I... I started trying more and more to make just one chapter really interesting. And then I sent it to a few people for feedback. And most of them came back and said, hey, this is just still too confusing. You got to make it simpler. But one person came back. This is Dan Shipper, also from the Every Newsletter. He came back and he said, you know, the, the structure of the scenes just isn't really working. And he's like, you know, you're, you're trying to basically tell a story, you know, in different scenes, like in a novel or something. He said, you should read this book on how to do that. And it's called Scene and Structure. And it's part of this series of books called The Elements of Fiction Writing. It's a fantastic series. I recommend it to basically everybody who's curious about this. And it was the first book I had read on fiction writing. And as soon as I read it, it just felt like this huge unlock. It was like, wow, like this is how you make something interesting. Like this is how you tell a story people get through. Like there's a formula here. It, it, it's very artistic and it's very creative, but there are like bedrocks you can lean on to make sure that this is going to be something that works. And 
after I read that, I literally like re outlined the whole book as like a succession of scenes and what's the main conflict in this scene? Who are the characters? What do they want? What's standing in their way? Like, what are going to be the beats in here? Uh, what's going to be the turn at the end of the scene? How does that lead to the next one? Like, I got very formulaic about it. And then I just kept reading more fiction writing books and bringing in more of those techniques. The other one from that series I really love is called Conflict and Suspense. And it's basically how to write a thriller. It's like, how do you keep somebody on the edge of their seat with your story? Like, what are the little, like, tiny, tiny things you can do in dialogue, in action, in, like, the description of the environment, all of that, so that people are really curious about what's going to happen next. And then I basically took all of those techniques and then applied them to my story because I had, I had all the events that happened and then I could pull from those, the most interesting things to create this one narrative arc and then could apply the techniques like to that, to create this story. And so I really came at it like, you know, one of the, one of the types of writing I studied was uh, John Grisham. So I read his first book, A Time to Kill, great book, and was like, you know, what's so interesting here? Like, what about the writing is so compelling? I, I, I looked at Red Rising a good amount, which is another just phenomenal fantasy sci-fi book that really, like, clips are long. I, I looked for fun fiction books like that that were just, you know, page turners and said, you know, what can I do in my book that makes it feel like that? And really, really, really focused on that for a while. and you know, ended up learning a ton about writing that way. And it made the book so much better in the process because, you know, I, I didn't want to write it like a narrative nonfiction book where I'm trying to tell the story as a journalist. I wanted it to read like a thriller that just happened to be true events. Right. And that was way more helpful than any other, like how to write stuff that I looked at because, the, you know, describing things that was easier for me. I'd done more like article writing, nonfiction writing, but writing the page turner is a lot harder actually. And I think this is, I don't remember who I heard this from, but I think it's really true that really educated writers, you know, people with CFAs and things will kind of look down on commercial fiction, right? Like, oh, it's not highbrow enough. The, the, it's yeah. not flowery or, you know, they only want to write like East of Eden or Infinite Jest or whatever. You know, and, and like Dostoevsky, right? And those are all obviously incredible works of literature. But they don't sell as many copies as the Nora Roberts or the Agatha Christie or the James Patterson, right? And so in some ways, like, it is actually harder, I think, to write a really exciting page turner that people actually get through. And if you can do that while also teaching them something, that's almost like the ultimate win. And I, I think that really is what made it an interesting book at the end of the day is it's like, it's no, like most nonfiction books, you kind of have to like force yourself through. Cause you're like, I'm getting something from this. Like I'm going to be smarter at the end of it. But if it's like pulling you through it, that's way better. And that was kind of what I decided to try to do. Yeah. I mean, it does pull along. This is a, I mean, I, I read it over, I think like three or four days. Yeah. But you could theoretically finish it in a day. Like it's not at, one at of least those twenty percent of the people I've sent it to tell me they read it in a day, maybe two. Yeah. Like I, I don't think it's the type of book that you there's like some books even that are like really good that you just need to put down because it's very yeah. information dense. And not that this isn't information dense, but it feels like you're reading a story. Like yeah. I always find that for fiction books, and I struggle with this sometimes with made you think, it's like the fiction books we do, it can be like an 800 page book like East of Eden. And it's not hard to read that book. And then sometimes we'll read like a 300 page nonfiction book. And sometimes it's, you know, it takes me Way three weeks to, to yeah, finish yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends. You know, like I feel like when it pulls you along, it doesn't, it, it, you don't have to like take that time to digest it the way you do like a nonfiction book. What led to like one of my favorite features of this book, which I'm about to give the book to my mom to read. So cool. the ultimate test, she wants to read it and this will be the ultimate test. But I actually really like those explainer sections that you had. Yeah, and they were even helpful for me. Like some of them. OK, it's like, all right, sure. I know like what Bitcoin and Ethereum are. And like I knew what a smart contract was, but I didn't really understand, as you even heard in this conversation, like decentralized exchanges and, you know, other things like that that you had explainers on. 
was that a you decision or like did that come later after you'd written the book and then you gave it to some people and they were like well i don't really understand what this is was it like a before or after thing so that was a me decision because the first three drafts of the book all of those explanations were within the story yeah and it was just slowing it down too much because you'd get into these exciting things going on and then I would have to take three paragraphs or four paragraphs to explain something and it just kept killing all of the momentum and it it was really frustrating because you know I would give it to people and I could tell that they were having a hard time getting through the book because they would hit those explanations and then they would stop and I was just like what do I do here and I I was like, how can, can I make these like really short and really simplified? But then there was like too much getting stripped out. And then actually Cosette and I were driving somewhere and we listened to Kitchen Confidential on audiobook. And Bourdain does a bit of this in that book too, where he has like his story. And then he has these chapters where he like goes on rants about what you should and shouldn't have in your kitchen. And I was kind of like, that's separate. It's separate. Yeah. It's yeah. a separate thing. I was like, wait, that's perfect. I can just keep the really exciting stories as their own chapters and then have these little two to three page explainers in between them. And then if you'll notice, almost every chapter ends on like a kind of aggressive cliffhanger Yep. where you're like, shit, I really want to know what happens next. I, I, I have a page open right now. That's like okay. literally the epi- epitome of Go that. Ahead. These are the last two lines. Cassette was suddenly standing next to me with her hand on my back. What's going on? Are we okay? We need to get home, I said, right now. Yeah. End of chapter. <laughs> and like right before that, me and my friend are literally like running to the cars because something awful has just happened and we need to like get to our computers, right? And so, you know, you, you read that and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go read the next chapter. And I expect that half of people won't read the explainers or they'll read half of them, right? Like they'll read a portion, whichever ones are interesting. They're there if they want to go back to them, but they're not, most of them aren't necessary to the story, but I wanted them to be there for the people who who were curious about them. And I think it really, really worked as a structure. I think it was perfect for something like this that did need to convey some technical stuff if people wanted to understand it. But if you just want to read the story, you can just do that too, you know, flip two pages and keep going. You can always come back to it. I also love the little design touch where it yeah. says like confidential on there. Like it's, it's awesome. We, we had so much fun with the design. I mean, the, the chapter headers too, like there's a good example of one, right? Like the, the scrawl. Yep. Yeah. Love that. Is so cool. Um, the art thing too. The cover like, art's great. I love it. I mean, it, the, that's an interesting story of just like working with a publisher because they were very resistant to this at first. They wanted to do normal business book style. And that was kind of what they were sending in the beginning, both for the cover and for the page design and everything. And me and, you know, thankfully my editor was really into this idea too. We kept pushing back and saying, it's got to be crazier. It's got to be, you know, it it needs to look like it was hacked together by somebody strung out on caffeine and nicotine. And very like we, we used Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas as design inspiration for the cover because it's got that like crazy scrawly aspect to it. And I think it really, really works and it really pops, especially if this is going to be in the finance section of a bookstore. You're going to have all the monkey these... on the scene. Yeah. Thing is yeah. Awesome. Totally. So I, I love, I love how the design came together for it. Cause it's so fun. Yeah. It's, it's very eye catching. Even the font choice was, yeah, was on point. Yeah. Was that, it, like, and I don't know if, if you want to get into this or not, but like, obviously, just given your audience, self-publishing was an option for you. Mm-hmm. What? Because uh, that's usually I, I would say to somebody who doesn't have an audience, I think a publisher makes a lot of sense because, you know, even even if you ha- don't have an audience and you go with the publisher, that's not a guarantee of a successful book. Vice versa, too. I guess if you have an audience and you self-publish, not a guarantee of a successful book. But I feel like if you have an audience and you self-publish, you're probably if you have an audience no matter what you're probably getting off on the right foot what led you to the publisher versus you know going to to work with publisher versus self-publishing yeah i mean i i'd heard all of the criticisms of publishers that i think are common in our circles and you know had seen that there is potential to do very well self-publishing but you know i i kind of had this hunch that there's a reason that all of the big authors don't self-publish 
You know, you, you look at any major successful author who already has a major f- reader following behind them, you know, like a Michael Lewis or a Malcolm Gladwell or any of these guys, like they don't go self-publish their books. They keep working with the publisher. And so there must be something there that was not being captured in all of the like takedowns by the self-publishing influencers. And it turns out it is. It turns out there is like working with a publisher is actually sick. And I highly recommend it for everyone because like, yes, your, your take home self-publishing per book sold is going to be higher, but your distribution is going to be a lot lower. You're going to be taken a lot less seriously. International deals are way harder to get. Uh, you're going to have a much harder time like getting great talent to work on the book unless you're able to pay absurd amounts of money for it. You're going to have so many other things to like manage that you shouldn't be managing because you should be focused on writing. Like I, I ended up writing a whole like 4,000 word article on this called like why traditional publishing is, or I said traditional publishing is great actually, I think is the title because having gone through it now, I actually just feel so turned off by a lot of the self pub influencers on like Twitter because they're, they're sort of just like lying <laughs> like <laughs> about how bad trad pub is. And I will say the big caveat here, the big, big, big caveat is if your advance is less than like a hundred grand, they're not going to do much for you. Like, because they don't have you, much of a sunk cost. None. Exactly. They're not yep. invested enough. Um, if if you can't, if you have a big audience and you can't get more than 100K for your book, then I would self-publish. Or if you're doing book as a business card, or if you just really want to self-publish for the experience or the challenge or whatever, like go for it. But if a big publisher is going to throw, you know, a quarter million of dollars at you and they're going to handle the editing and the design and the copy editing and the legal read and the distribution and the international rights and like, all of these things that you actually don't really know anything about handling, you should do that because it's awesome. <laughs> what uh, what determines mm-hmm. the advance rate? Is it just based on audience size and category of book? Is that how they're yeah. determining basically market size or something? It's it's audience size, market size, you know, how relevant it is to some current event. And then honestly, a big part of it is competition for you as an author. So you know, like I, I got a preempt from portfolio where they basically made an offer to take my, to buy my book before it went to auction. And they were the main publisher I wanted to work with. And so like loved it. And it was a great deal. They gave me 275K as an advance, which is fantastic advance. I know another person with an audience that was about the same size as mine who got a preempt from two big publishers and so this person took their book to auction and the three three publishers ended up bidding on it and bidding each other up and their advance ended up being 900 grand. Wow. And so, you know, similar audience size, like similar metrics going into it, but they got almost like three and a half X the advance because they had multiple people fighting over it. Yeah. So, so it became a bidding war basically. Was it, yeah. was it also in a fairly broad applicable category? That, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they, they had a broader category that they could put it in, you know, they could kind of frame it as like the next atomic habits, potentially they, they had some of that stuff to lean on. And like, you know, crypto, especially two years ago when I was pitching this, you know, we had just had Luna blow up and three yep. years capital and, you know, FTX hadn't blown up, but it blew up solely after. And, you know, it wasn't clear if crypto was coming back or not to an outsider. And all of the books that were getting sold were anti-crypto books. And the, then on the top of market, that... The bull market yeah. came back at the right time. <laughs> right time. <laughs> on, on top of that, Michael Lewis, everybody knew Michael Lewis was doing a book about crypto. So it's like, do you really want to compete with Michael Lewis? Yeah. And there was, you know, those factors, I think, made it challenging. But it worked. So, yeah. Uh, we could talk for another hour and a half, sure, uh, and we will on Made You Think we next will. week. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess by the time this comes out, that Made You Think episode will probably already be out. Come out, yeah. We're on the same anyway, time. if you want to hear more of me and Nat talking, go, go listen made to you Made You Think. think. Yeah. There's a lot of, I think, over 110 episodes now, so plenty more where this came from. Doing work. Enjoyed this yeah. conversation. Nat, where can people buy the book? Where can they find you? Uh, where should they follow you? Yeah, Crypto Confidential, anywhere books are sold. It's, you know, in all the major online retailers. It's on Audible. The audiobook is actually sick. I'm not an audiobook person, but like hum- humbly, I-, I crushed the audiobook. It's really good. <laughs> I- I had a lot and you of- read it, right? Yeah, which is, yeah. Which is I- great. I read it. it. The-, the woman who directed it was great. 
I, I really learned a lot about doing audiobooks. I would do it again. I, I mean, I would do it for a friend's book. I had a ton of fun with it. And so, yeah, you can get it anywhere if you want. Like my articles and other writing, it's blog.nataliason.com. And then I'm most active on Twitter at Nataliason. Yep. One of my favorite shit posters. Just focus on book and writing stuff. You know, I feel you like I've are. gotten boring. Maybe I got to bring it back. I know. I feel like you go through phases with it. It's like when you're busy working on other projects, I think Twitter yeah, is like quite less interesting for you. Uh, and it, then when you're like bored and in this creative space, then you're uh, way more way more of a fun follow but the 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 problem is like i'll I'll often the reason i i don't ship post as much anymore is that i often have my best ideas for incendiary tweets right before i sit down to do my normal writing it's a procrastination technique for sure not only that but it then impacts the whole writing session because i feel like i have to go check on the tweet every 10 15 minutes and so i will i'll kind of often do this thing where I send out a tweet before I start writing and then I'll go, no, I don't want to have to check on this in 15 minutes. And then I'll go back and delete it so I can actually <laughs> focus. <laughs> well, your incendiary tweets have led to being mentioned in S1s, right? For <laughs> yeah, the, 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 oh, uh, that's a, that's a proud accomplishment, honestly. It is. <laughs> well, doing good work there. <laughs> that, that's one that. of those articles where I'm like, man, am I ever going to write another article that good? I'm like, I hope so. Because that was... That was a banger. <laughs> that is also the case where an article that should have been an article was an article. Like you yeah. couldn't go write a book about that. No, it couldn't be a yeah, book. Yeah. Like a tweet is a book enough. on the concept. But yeah. Yeah. It's not concept, long enough. Yeah. Article was just right. All right. Well, go buy the book. Go follow Nat. Go listen Thanks, to Made Matt. You Think. Uh, Nat, excited for this book to come out. I Thanks, think uh, excited too. a lot of people are, are going to learn a lot and uh, hopefully it'll fuel the next uh, next bubble. No, I'm just kidding. Mania, we can all go play together. It'll be great. Yep. All right. Thanks, Nat. See ya.